Welcome here come the Irish. I'm Michael Owens. And I'm Nick Southwood. Hope everybody's having a good weekend. I know we had a great weekend. We were hanging out in Cincinnati. Got to check out uh, Xavier's facilities from a friend, Absolutely. as well as old Xavier basketball arena where Oscar Robertson played. So Absolutely. Pretty incredible to stand on the same court of one of the greatest basketball players in the history of the United States. There's some, something to do in the offseason. Uh, we are battling cold, so uh, take that in consideration. We'll try to bear with us here. All right. Uh, we've got a great show today. We are interviewing one of our favorite basketball players of all time, Kyle McInlarty. Um, from Notre Dame in 2008-2009 season. Was really big in that Maui, that Maui Invitational. So we've got a lot of things, including Maui, that we're going to discuss with Kyle. Let's uh, get him on the phone. Absolutely. Hi, Kyle. This is uh, Mike Lowens. And Nick Southwood from Here Come the Irish. How are you doing today? I'm great, guys. How are you? Uh, pretty good, uh, besides the cold weather. Um, we know we got a lot of questions. Yeah. I sent, sent a lot of them over to you. So um, we're just going to get started with the very first one. We like to ask a lot of former players when they come on here. The very first one is, why did you choose to go to Notre Dame and play for Coach Bray? Well, it's a great question. Uh, one I get answered all the time. And... Really, there was no other place, man. Um, an Irish Catholic kid here from Staten Island, New York. Been a Notre Dame fan my whole life. Once they got into the mix, recruiting me, there there was no other choice. There, there was nowhere else to go. I'll give you a, a quick little story. When I was uh, visiting Notre Dame, uh, it was during finals, so there wasn't a lot going on, but Coach Gray had myself and my mother out to his house with all the, with all the players and uh, my dog had just died a couple days before, two or three days before. My dog, Gabby, Black Lab, had just died two or three days before. And this was my childhood dog, right? So I was, I was devastated over this. I get into Coach Bray's house, and a Black Lab comes running up to me and my mother. And uh, uh, Mrs. Bray, um, Tish Bray, starts saying, Gabby, Gabby, come here. Funny enough, that, that that's a story that I kind of hang on to. Of, wow, this is this is um, some some deeper stuff going on here, and uh, this is this is the place. So uh, obviously, Coach Bray played a big part in it. Uh, the style of play played a big part in it. The school and the reputation and and what it could do for me uh, as a person was was the biggest uh, component. Yeah, I mean that, that's a, that's a great story, and like a lot of people we have on here, former athletes and stuff in Notre Dame. <laughs> Just um, the time they're there, then, like they said, four for 40 um, when they leave Notre Dame and just the connections across the country, Notre Dame fan base. And like you said, it is bigger than just, than just basketball. It certainly is, man. You know, the, the guys that I, that I graduated with there are, are brothers to me and, and really the best people I've ever met have, have been from that place. And it's uh, – it's a special, special place, and, and I tell everybody that, and everybody says it, you know, and it's, it's, you hear it from everybody, but until you know exactly what the deal is out there, it's, uh, it's hard to get a, to get a hold on, on how special a place it is. But, but I'm very proud. It's, it's my proudest achievement is, is graduating from there. That is pretty awesome. It is definitely a special place. Um, going along with that, obviously Coach Bray is a special coach as well. Um, his coaching style from what I've seen and just from I've, what I've watched is different than any other coach in college basketball. Um, just wanted to see if you could kind of attest to his coaching style and exactly um, how he lets you guys play and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, Coach Bray is definitely different. He coaches differently than every other coach. Um, he's, he's not a micromanager. He likes to give guys a lot of confidence. Uh, he does not overcoach. Um, he, he lets guys make mistakes. He lets guys play through mistakes. And it, there, there's something to that, right? With especially with a sport like basketball, because you need a little bit of freedom. You know, we're not robots out there. And and because of the kind of kids that he recruits, you know, high IQ players, it works. And and really, you know, I've tried. I've tried, and it is difficult to model at least a little bit of what I do after him in terms of, you know, not over coaching and really playing to the guy's strengths, keeping a positive atmosphere and environment 
Um, and, you know, aside from that and off the court, he is as down to earth a guy as you'll ever meet. So, um, uh, you know, for, for, for me, I, 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 my story alone will, will tell you that he really cares for his players. Um, he went out of his way, especially with me, um, numerous times. But I just think, you know, his coaching style, it fits for the kind of guys we get at Notre Dame. But it's the kind of coach you want to be, right? Because the, the environment is so positive around him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like um, not overcoaching, especially with the style of basketball play Notre Dame plays, plays with a lot of three-point shooters. I mean, you're going to have cold nights. You're going to have hot nights. Um, same thing as me as a baseball player. You're going to have days where you go 0 for 4, or you go 4 for 4, and just keep shooting. Shooters got to shoot is what they say. And then just from, like, being a fan's perspective, I'll see on the social media accounts Mike Bray playing the drums before a game or when they won uh, the Maui tournament uh, last year, he just had his shirt off with one of those lays around his neck. He just seems like a great coach to play for. Sure. Well, again, you know, it's the environment that that creates for you, right? I mean, you go into some of these games, man, you don't need a pep talk playing against Duke, North Carolina, Virginia, um, NC State. You don't need a pep talk going, you know, going into those games. You know, I think what you need is, is what he gives you. Is he kind of, you know, calms you down a little bit. It kind of lets you know that, hey, my coach is behind me. My coach is doing okay. He's loose. We're, we're meanwhile, I'll be on the inside. He's, he's flipping out as much. But um, it, it does break down those walls a little bit. And, and he is a human. And he, it just it, it helps give the guys confidence, you know. It helps them play at ease a little bit. And, um, again, with the kind of guys you get at Notre Dame, high IQ guys, you got to let them be got to let them breathe out there on the court and for me it worked for my era it worked and it was uh it was a lot of fun to play man the, the, the environment the locker room was the best i've ever been a part of yeah so obviously you know that team was a special team uh playing like guys with luke zeller and Aaron Gody and all those kind of guys and i mean even in your uh senior season um, pretty unbelievable what you could accomplish with shooting 43% from behind the arc um, and 124 uh, three-pointers made in your senior season. That's very impressive stats, and uh, it's probably the biggest reason why we play with Notre Dame on uh, NCAA 2009, just to let you pop off and hit a bunch of threes. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate that. We, uh, we had a special group there. Uh, like anybody would say, they had a special group when they graduated from Notre Dame. But for us, uh, we, were, uh, um, we were all guys who could shoot, pass, and, and knew how to play. And it was a lot of fun to play uh, in that system with with guys like Luke Allen, go to Luke Zeller, Rob Kerr, Ryan Air, Zach Hillsland, Tory Jackson. You know, those, we, we had a special group. And, man, those, those are the funnest times I've ever had playing basketball. Um, and they gave me the ability to shoot that way, and, and you know I, I credit them for for every single three that I that I ever hit out there. And and what would you say? Um, I know it's probably a combination of things. What would you say was kind of key for you becoming a great shooter? Maybe early on in your life, how you practiced, or just get a, the amount of shots, or just the form. What would you say was really key to you becoming such a high percentage three point shooter? You know, I wish I had a secret, man, but repetition. Repetition. Um, when I was in high school, I had the key to my gym, which is my, my current school, and I still have the same key, by the way. Uh, I, I would get in the gym at 4.30 in the morning, and, and this is this is just true. 4.30 every single morning, I was in there shooting, bone handling, jump rope, trying to, trying to do what I had to do to, to improve as a player. Uh, and, and while I was at Notre Dame, I got introduced to the shooting machine, which is a, a, a machine that rebounds and kicks the ball out to you, and that became my best friend. Every morning I was in the pit down there in the practice facility, uh, shooting. Uh, repetition was, was the key to it all. Um, I had a really relentless pursuit of, 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 of greatness. And I just, I knew that that's what I had to do in order to kind of stand out. And that, I wanted to stand out. I didn't want to just fit in. And that was, I knew I had to, I had to, do that. I had to be a great three-point shooter in order for me to stand out. Being uh, as small as I am, and, and you know, I, I was quick, but not the quickest guy, and not being able to elevate and finish at the rim. I knew I had to stand out some way uh, in order to basically become a professional basketball player. So, rep. 
repetition alone is really what, what, what I would say was is the key to it all. We can talk about form and technique and who I tried to pattern things off of and uh, toughness and confidence and uh, courage and, and guts to take some of those shots. But uh, for me, it was all about repetition. Just, you know, that was my, that was where I won. Was I got there first in the gym and I left last and I was there longer than anybody. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, it sounds like it's a combination of just hard work, uh, some God-given ability, as well as, like you were saying earlier with Coach Bray, just being fearless and, and playing loose. So shooting, if not, don't, not being afraid to shoot, and if you're having a bad night, keep shooting some more. If you're having a good night, have the same mentality. Well, absolutely, and, and Coach Bray played a huge hand in that because if you look at his teams, he's always had a, a three-point marksman there. I'm going back to the days of uh, – Matt Carroll and Colin Falls, Chris Quinn, those are the guys that I grew up really watching and studying under and, and, and seeing how much freedom they had to play with under Coach Bray really excited me. And when, when I got the opportunity there, I, I really kind of took hold to it and, and tried to take it to another level in terms of shooting from NBA range and beyond. Again, because I knew that's what I had to do in order for me to stand out and, and really kind of stay on the court because uh, it was it was difficult for me to keep up with some of these athletes. So uh, that was what I had to do. It was a survival technique, and Coach Bray uh, allowed me to do it and encouraged me to do it. Uh, and I had I had so much confidence behind me through him that you know I would I would go over ten and still be shooting out there. And I, I watch some of those games now and think, what the heck was I doing? <laughs> I mean, some of the shots that I took were were really ridiculous. But you know, he he didn't say a word. He never said a word. He never helped me back, and uh, it got the best out of me. Well, obviously, that uh, confidence kind of gets a little contagious uh, going around the team as well. Uh, especially when looking at the Maui tournament. You know, you guys beat Indiana by thirty eight points. You beat number six Texas. I mean, you guys had some very impressive wins over the course of that run. Um, and even though, you know, North Carolina, that was a tough loss, but um, just the confidence, I'm sure, that Coach Bray instilled allowed you guys to play the style of basketball that was able to beat such good teams, like I said, like Indiana and Texas. We, we were rolling at that point in the season, and uh, I remember going into that tournament, actually. Uh, we, we made a stop at Loyola Mount in L.A. We played a game there, and it was a really tough game in a tough environment down to the wire. And I missed every shot I took. I didn't score one point in that game. And I was embarrassed. I was pissed. I was so mad going into that Maui. And, and I had a, a different mindset going to the Maui tournament. And, and that kind of sparked me to have, you know, some of those games there. But uh, going into that North Carolina game, you know, back then we were in the Big East, so we didn't play Carolina and Duke every season like, like the guys do now. Matching up with them and seeing them across the court in warm-ups, um, my blood was boiling. I was I was so so excited to play against them. I mean, this is North Carolina, and mind you, they were number one at the time, uh, number one ranked team. Uh, we were clicking on all cylinders. Unfortunately, I think Howard Gordy actually woke up that morning with some sort of a fever. He was he was sick that day, I believe, going up against Tyler Hansbrough. Um, so we got the most out of what we could. Uh, from him, and, and you know, I, I think we were a little outmatched talent-wise. But um, boy, I remember waking up uh, after that North Carolina game in the morning, and I had about a uh, hundred, hundred fifty texts and emails from from people back in Staten Island who watched that game. And, uh, three games in a row, three tough games in a row, and three story programs, college basketball. Uh, if I could relive that tournament again. I'd, I'd be I'd be a happy person. I'd, I'd be happy to die after that. <laughs> okay, that North Carolina game, I remember that like it like it just like it was yesterday. It was almost like a decade ago. That's crazy how long ago it was. Um, would you say it was one of the best shooting games you've ever had? I, I think it was maybe around ten or twelve threes. You just kept shooting against North Carolina, and just getting that score a little closer. But you hit at everything you shot that game. That was incredible. Yeah, you know it, it, it was. Um... So that summer, going into my senior year, was uh, Steph Curry was was really starting to uh, make a name for himself, and uh, I, I, I remember setting a goal for my 
myself. It was something like 23,000 threes to hit over the course of a month. It was something crazy. And I just really was dialed in that summer and worked very hard. And this was at the beginning of the season, and, and I was I was healthy. I was feeling very strong physically. Um, again, going into the Maui, playing this three-story program, you, you got to get up for those, right? If you don't get up for those, you got nothing inside of you. Um, and I, I was just I was ready to play. And here we are against North Carolina, and, and the game got a little bit of, out of away from us. We were down 15 or 20. And, um, I just had to do something. I had to do something to try and get us back into it. Um, and I uh, hit a few, started shooting some ridiculous shots. And um, to, to be honest with you, it, it wasn't a thought going through my head of should I shoot this, should I not shoot this. So it, it was more of how can I get, how can I help us get back into this game? Um, and, you know, I, I didn't realize how many threes I had hit um, at the end of the game. I just was kind of, Really, really in the moment, as, as they say. Um, again, waking up the next morning, you know, all the Staten Island bars were, were packed with people watching it. And, uh, that game still follows me to this day. <laughs> um, but I don't think it was my best shooting game. I do not think it was my best shooting game. I think I shot 10 for 19 from three. Uh, I don't know who shoots 19 threes, right? But 10 and 19 from three, and I, some other games stick out in my head as, as better shooting performances in terms of efficiency. But uh, in terms of making noise and, and the, the degree of difficulty, that was probably number one. Hey, James Harden goes 12 for 40. Everybody thinks he's a hero. But <laughs> that, that's all right, man. That, yeah, it was an awesome game. Like I said, it seems just like it was yesterday uh, when you guys were playing uh, North Carolina there in Mali. It was just uh, – that was an awesome tournament. And then, unfortunately, uh, Mike Bray and the Irish, uh, about a year ago, were able to go back there and uh, finally get the whole thing won. But that was a great game itself if you were able to watch that as well. Yeah, I was. I was. I watched that over in in France when I was over there playing. Um, funny how things come full circle, and really the program has taken a, a big step up here since I graduated, and and, and, it, and it has been ten years, by the way. I graduated in two thousand nine, so it has been ten years. Uh, but Coach Bray has taken uh, this this program to to another level here, and uh, it's great to see them go back to the Maui and, and win it. Absolutely. Kind of um, going back to that 2009, that, around that time, what was it like to play in the old Big East? Obviously, they have the new Big East now. It's kind of like almost half the teams. Um, what was it like playing in that old Big East when I think that was the best basketball conference around now? I obviously think it's the ACC, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, i got to be honest. You know, I'm going to be honest. In my opinion, um, the, the Big East back then was much better than what the ACC is right now. And it, and, and not in terms of talent, but in terms of rivalry, matchups, and, and the grittiness and the toughness of it. You know, we're talking about um, Syracuse, Louisville, um, St. John's, all the story programs, Georgetown, Marquette, DePaul, Notre Dame, uh, all these story programs playing against each other. And it was tough. It was tough. There was, I know there's no nights off now in the ACC. It's, it's a crazy talented league, that's, that's for sure. But Back then, just being a New York City kid as I am, you know, playing in the Big East was, was a dream come true for me. And um, I, I longed for, for watching some of those games. I mean, I was just watching today, Seton Hall was great. And it's just not the same. It's just not the same. I mean, you know, you still get, you know, throwing over Seton Hall, St. John's, some of those teams, but the Syracuse, Pittsburgh, um, you know, the city kids, the Northeast kids playing against each other. There's, there was nothing like that. Um, and and uh, I longed for that. I missed that. That was tough. We had a specific identity uh, in the Big East that I think we missed down the ACC. You know, we were, we were the shooters. We were the, the, probably the, the smartest team in the league, especially offensively. We led the country and assisted turnover almost every single year. Um, and we were very, very difficult to guard. You know, then you had Syracuse playing an athletic 2-3 zone. You had um, Providence playing the zone. You had Pittsburgh, and they were just rough and tough. No fight shifts. Throwing over, had the guards. I mean, you know, everybody had an identity in the Big East, and it followed. Um, it started from there, who their coach was. It was just, it was uh, and playing, of course, in the Big East tournament at, at the guard. Uh, there's nothing like it, and I miss it. I miss it. When I 
watch games now. I miss it. Yeah, and another testament to just how good the Big East is, I'm just thinking about the last 10 or 12 years. UConn's won two titles. Who was a member of the big old Big East. Uh, Louisville won one. And then obviously Villanova's won two in the last few years. And those are all the old Big East schools. That's five championships right there in just like the last decade, like last decade or so I can think of. And the Big East was – that was a great basketball conference. It really was. It really was. And, and I know again now the ACC there's no nights off. And really back then um, it was a different feel to it. I, I, I fully believe it was a more physical league. Uh, it was more physical. The refs let you play a little bit more. Um, and the matchups and the rivalries that, that you would get was uh, just a little little more intense. And uh, there was a little more uh, of a story behind each one. And that, that, that's what I missed. But uh, I do feel that it was the best league. Uh, speaking of the old Big East, um, obviously, like you were saying, Syracuse, Villanova, UConn, and even playing that tournament at uh, Madison Square Garden, um, what would you say were like the hardest road games to go play in the Big East? West Virginia was tough. Um, West Virginia was very <laughs> tough. Um, remember playing that my freshman year and not knowing that they actually shook a musket off during Walmart. <laughs> that kind of made me jump a, a little bit. But West Virginia was really tough. Pittsburgh was was pretty tough, um, especially as a freshman when you're, the, when you're basically a baby going into those big arenas. And, and I got a lot of time as a freshman. And, um, you know, I thought I was I thought I was fearless until going to one of those places. Uh, Pittsburgh was tough. West Virginia was tough. Marquette was pretty tough. Just be, I think that was more of, of the style of play that they played. Um, UConn playing on campus was, was really difficult. Um, you know, boy, Syracuse at the Cali Dome, um, Georgetown, you know, all these places was, you know, the Rack, Rutgers at, at playing with the Rack. It, it's hard to pick one out. One, you know, it's hard to pick one out, but all of them were, were if I could go back and do it again, I, boy, I would, I would trade a whole lot to go do it because that, 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 that's, what this, that's what college basketball uh, is all about. And uh, that's what would make the Big E so special is you go into these arenas and, and uh, you try and compete and you try and win versus the whole crowd. It was fun. Well, speaking of uh, some arenas, you know, obviously playing in an arena that's made for basketball is completely different than playing in a place like Lucas Oil Stadium that is a huge, like, football-like stadium. Um, just shooting-wise, like, as a shooter that that's, like, your main thing, how did that, like, affect maybe, like, your perception or your shot going into those games at a place that's not necessarily designed to play basketball in? Such as Carry Dome, too, yeah. Lucas Oil was tough uh, against Ohio State. We played Ohio State there. Uh, I, had a, I, had a, I had a terrible game. I played. They, they locked me up. Fat Bottom and, um, and crew. Evan Turner was on that team. They, they a lot held me to like six points, and uh, I don't think I got a good look at the basketball game. Uh, they did an excellent job and, and frustrated me that game. Uh, but it's different. It's different to shoot. The depth, depth perception is. Totally different. Syracuse at the Cali Dome, um, you know, they, they play the zone, so as a shooter, you kind of, you're roaming around freely a little bit, so you think you're open, but because they're length, you're not, and then you get a look at the basket, and you're staring at 30,000 people. It's, it's a different feel. Um, the air is different. The noise is actually, it's, it's totally different. Um, you're not used to it. Um, you know, I think over the course of the game, you do get used to it. You know, but when you get there, when you start to warm up, and maybe in the first half you you're trying to feel it out. But over the course of the game, you do get used to it. You do just start to just focus on, on what you got to do to win, and, and if you don't you don't think about it much. And the rims are ten feet, and then you get going, and you, know, you go from there. Absolutely. Uh, kind of speaking with like this old Big East rivalries, I know there's a Notre Dame rivalry that's kind of um, a lot of fans, younger fans don't really know about the Notre Dame UCL, UCLA rivalry. I know back in like the uh, Digger Phelps era, Notre Dame was always like around the top five, top 10, and uh, UCLA obviously was like under John Wooden had all those great teams, and the famous uh, upset Notre Dame had came down by like 10 points down to UCLA. But if I did my research correct, I think you played there um, at Poly Pavilion 
uh, your senior year. Uh, and, and then Notre Dame, this this, uh, this year they already played UCLA at Poly Pavilion, I think, next year that the Bruins come to South Bend. So um, do you like this rivalry that Notre Dame has, and what were your thoughts about it? Sure. Um, any, I, you know, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because you have UCLA, which is obviously Hollywood, and, and then you have Notre Dame, which kind of, you know, symbolizes, you know, the blue-collar Catholic school Midwest, you know, uh, kind of rough and tough kind of kind of feel to it in South Bend and with the, the harsh winters. And UCLA has got the sun year round, and it's 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 definitely an interesting matchup in terms of the brand of each school. But boy, we got our asses kicked there when we went there. Um, <laughs> I think we lost by like thirty, um, thirty five even. Um, they they just kind of put it on us, and I remember Coach Bray coming in the locker room and kicking the uh, the. Uh, the uh, what the garbage can over <laughs> as soon as he came in the locker room, kicked the garbage can over. Because well, if Mike Bray's getting that we, mad. We didn't show well. Yeah, if Coach Bray's getting that mad, he must be uh, pretty pet. Yeah, we we didn't show up that game. We did not show up. And, uh, the bright lights probably disturbed us a little bit. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I'd love to see that that I get going and. and you know, nowadays it's not that difficult. California and South Bend. I mean, we used to charter flights um, going around the country whenever we had to travel, and I'm sure it's a little even better now. Uh, so it's it's definitely not that difficult uh, logistically. It's just a matter of uh, committing to it. But I think it's a good little rivalry. Um, I'd love to see some of the Big East teams get put back on our schedule if possible. I mean, I know that's a lot to ask, but you know, Notre Dame Syracuse was. It's always uh, a nice little rivalry, you know, Syracuse um, being a New York school, a lot of Notre Dame fan base is, is huge here in New York, so that, seeing schools like that get back in the fold would, would make me happy, but Notre Dame UCLA definitely uh, is one to, uh, to continue to grow, uh, but I, I remember, and I wish I didn't, I remember, I remember though, that day when we played at Pauly and we got, boy, we got spanked. Yeah, this uh, that was the past fall. Notre Dame went there. If you're able to see that, they played at Pauley, and um, uh, UCL play, UCLA player hit a, a game. I think it might have been Chris Wilkes, or it was, they hit a, a game winning three with about as the uh, clock expired. And uh, I think Steve Alford ended up getting fired just a couple months ago too. Mm-hmm. So they'll come to South Bend next year. Hopefully, we'll pay them back. But as you were saying, uh, we were in Cincinnati just yesterday because we're, we're here in Indianapolis, so we made a little road trip to our friend in Cincinnati, and we we're like. Man, we'd love to see Notre Dame play out here. It's a short drive for them too, and um, some of these old Big East schools. It'd be it'd be nice to see them play them too. But uh, kind of transitioning uh, with the ACC, I know you're talking about it earlier. Uh, Mike Bray started five and one against Dukes in the ACC, and he beat North Carolina several times and NC State several times, and all these kind of powerhouses. Um, what would you What would you say about Notre Dame playing in the ACC and the kind of good start they got off to? Very impressive, isn't it? I mean, I mean, I think as good as the ACC is now, you know, the, there was a lot of questions surrounding how we would fare um, in the ACC. Uh, I, I think you see Coach Bray has started to recruit a little bit differently. If you look at some of the talent that he's gotten in, uh, it's, 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 you know, as I said before, we had a very specific identity there in the Big East. Um, now with the ACC, you know, I don't know if I'd be I don't know if I'd be as good as I was playing in this current ACC. Uh, it's just a different athlete out there, um, and he, he's had to adapt, and he's done that. Um, and I think speaking again to the environment that he creates, going up against Duke and North Carolina, these these guys, and, and by these guys I mean our guys at Notre Dame players, um, they they feel like they have nothing to lose because Coach Bray just kind of. You know, he's, he's the loosest coach in America, um, and he gives them a lot of confidence. So they go out there with nothing to lose, and and uh, the athletes that he's recruited uh, work in the ACC. They, they, they fit there. Uh, but the success that he's had, am I surprised being an insider? No, I'm not surprised. But I think from an outsider's perspective, people should be um, should be proud if you're a Notre Dame fan and, and of the success that he's had because we've, we've really made a lot of noise here in the past five to seven years. Um, and, and all it really took, right, is, is uh, one, 
one game there, if we would have beat that Kentucky team, I forget what year it was in the Sweet 16, or maybe it was the Elite Eight, we were going. We were going to go to the Final Four. He was going to get us there. Um, so Coach Bray, you know, all hats off to him and, and the job he's done um, since moving to the ACC has been incredible. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, in recent history, it was really nice to see him finally um, have turn- really good tournament success where he went back-to-back Elite Eights, and like you were saying, uh, if you watch that game, Notre Dame could easily have beaten that Kentucky team who was like 31-0 and or something crazy at the time. And then they played North Carolina the next year, too, and uh, almost beat them. They had a really good game. As well as winning the ACC, beating Duke and North Carolina to win the ACC tournament championship. As for Notre Dame being a football school, um, to do that in basketball is just incredible. And just the, the success that maybe a lot of people might have been skeptical when they joined the ACC, especially for uh, basketball. Maybe they thought they wouldn't be able to compete, but – Going to the winning the ACC tournament, and then here just a few years ago playing Duke in the ACC tournament championship again with Colson and Farrell. Um, I think these these last two years, a lot of injuries and outliers, a lot of young guys. But I think here in the next few years, they're really going to get back to having tournament success and and being really good again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, everyone loves the NCAA tournament, right? But let's not forget that we did win the NCC tournament there, and that's that's a big deal. It's a big deal, and uh, it's very, very difficult to do that. You know, it's really over the course of one week, and it's a big deal. You know, imagine going back, rewinding to the Big East that we're raving about right now, and, and going on a stretch like like they did in the ACC and winning the Big East tournament at the Garden. I mean, it's a it's a big deal. You know, it's that's that's a hell of a thing uh, to hang that banner in, in, at Notre Dame. It's, it's uh, in the short time that he's done it. And, you know, I think this this team that they currently have is they are young. They're dealing with a few injuries here, but um, they're going to be very good here in the next two years. And um, I think uh, you know that that's a credit to the coaching staff and the way that they've recruited. Yeah, and another testament to winning the ACC tournament was if you think about it, it was in North Carolina and Duke's backyard. They were playing at a. Um, what was it? What's I'm trying to think of the name of that city. I just can't, uh, lost it. Top top of my head. Greensboro, yep, Greensboro. So that's that arena full of North Carolina and Duke fans. They're basically playing on the road, and to win that was just even a better testament to how great they were that year. Yeah, but you know, obviously with with a few NBA players there, Jerry and Pat and and um, Demetrius, but you know, definitely. Uh, uh, a huge, huge accomplishment, and, and I remember watching that, being like, "Wow, <laughs> you know, this is this is our this is this is taking the program to another level," and I think it's helped to recruiting wise. Uh, kind of just transitioning a little bit here. Um, I know we kind of spoke a little bit earlier about like what it was like playing with you know Luke Zeller, Luke Aaron Gody, um, Ryan Ayers, all those kind of guys. Um, but just curious, what players and coaches do you mostly keep up with or keep up with most frequently? Well, Ryan Ayers is, is like my best friend in the world. Um, he was my roommate. Um, I could fly. We, we talk very often. Um, Zach Hillsland, I'll be going to his wedding here in a, in, in a few months. Um, it's out Ben actually. Um, Luke Zeller, I haven't spoken to in a while. Um, Kieran Pillar, who was a walk-on um, at Notre Dame while I was there, he's also one of my better friends. Uh, Rob Kerr's a great friend. Um, you know, really, and it's funny, you know, those guys probably I speak to um, the most frequently, but whenever I get together, whenever we get together, uh, it's like you pick up where you left off, and I'm sure you understand that. Everybody can understand if they have friends like that, but you know, the, the battles that we've been through the things that we've seen and done together and, and how we grew up together, uh, you know, it's like I cannot speak to these guys for a year and, and, and see them again because everybody is very busy and especially everybody's a basketball player, so we're all busy at the same time. Uh, but, you know, Ryan, Ryan is one of my better friends. And he's, he's, I consider him like family. And, um, uh, Kieran Pillar uh, and Zach Hillsland as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We all um, we just graduated college ourselves here in the last uh, year, and just like you said, trying to keep up with people too. It's it's so hard when you when you get older and you get jobs and that sort of thing. Um, kind of transition to the next question um, for you. We have 
is what was it your experience like playing in the developmental league as well as over in Europe? What was it like to play over there? Well, it's two different experiences. I mean, the development league is, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I, I improved so much as a basketball player because that's all you do is just play. That's all you do is play. And I played for two very good coaches, Joan Meyer and D. Brown. Um, it was, I, you know, I was just fresh out of college, so I didn't, um, I didn't need a lot of money, but I didn't make a lot of money either. Uh, but I did improve a lot as a basketball player, figure out my, my identity as a professional and figure out my routine there and uh, whatnot and, and sort of navigate those waters. And uh, that was an interesting experience, a positive one, a very positive one. Uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. I'm a huge fan of what is now called the G League, but I'm a huge fan of that league. Um, and I'm a proponent of it, and I, and I benefited greatly from it. Um, European experience, I mean, I could talk all day about it. Um, Greece was different than France, and certain years in France were different than others, but um, overall, it was a life-changing, life-changing experience. Just getting to know different people, getting to know different cultures, learning the French language. I was, I was in France for seven years. Being as popular as I was in France, uh, really cementing roots there in France. And I was with one team for five years and becoming uh, the club's all-time leading scorer and uh, having many, many friends still over there. Uh, I cherish my time over there because of basketball, but even though off the court, my wife and I, we started our family there. I have two young children, and uh, that's where my son really saw his first everything. Uh, and uh, very, very special place to me um, over there. Um, this one city in France, Orléans. And I, uh, you know, I, I can't speak enough about how positive uh, experience I had over there. Um, were there tough times? 1,000%. I mean, I, I, was, a, I was alone a lot. Uh, I used to get anxiety about, you know, what my next, that would be what my next career would be. Um, I missed a whole lot. I missed weddings, funerals, parties, you name it. I missed everything. Um, but I sacrificed because I still loved the game. I still loved to play the game. And I was playing at a high level last year when I decided to hang it up. But um, do I miss it? Yes, I do miss it. Uh, but I'll cherish it forever. I'll cherish it forever. And it, it changed me. Um, it certainly changed me, and um, what I wanted out of my career, I got. Uh, with uh, living in Europe, what what was it like? Um, maybe off off the the court in in Europe, um, did you have? Um, did you meet your wife in Europe, or did she um, come from the United States over there uh, to spend time with you? So as as you know, ironic as it seems, my wife is from five minutes where I grew up. Uh, I met my wife and I was a senior at Notre Dame. Uh, I met her through a friend back home. Um, and she was back and forth with me for a little bit while she was still working. And then once we got married, she came over with me full time. Um, off the court, what's it like? I mean, you know, you practice twice a day. Um, and you pretty much have one day off per week, most weeks. And um, you, you try and, you know, you try and sightsee as much as you can, but it is difficult because you do have a busy schedule. Uh, we immersed ourselves into the great local scene. Uh, to, you know, we tried different restaurants. We we explored different um, different cities around the area in which we lived. Uh, we did have a house over there. Uh, we had a house, a car. Um, we were able to live a, a pretty normal life. We just tried to, you know outside of our comfort zone as much as we want. We were living outside of our comfort zone. Um, we did miss a lot. Um, uh, we did miss a lot. And, you know, it wasn't all roses and rainbows. It was, it was, uh, it was, there were some tough times over there. But we, we overall, again, a extremely positive experience for both of us. And my wife probably misses it more than I do right now. Just peace and quiet that we had over there. <laughs> 
Kind of transitioning like you were talking about earlier. Um, you were, said you had some anxiety about what you're going to do after your basketball career. It looks like you've um, kind of found out what you wanted to do. See that you're uh, the head coach and associate athletic director at Moore Catholic High School. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, I knew I'm a, I'm a basketball junkie. There, there is no, there is nothing else for me. It's, it's basketball and, and that's really it. And my kids and my wife, I'm, that's, you know, my wife has to pull me away from games when, when they're on TV. She has to turn it off because it's just who I am. Uh, I've been training kids uh, privately um, via basketball uh, since I was a sophomore in high school. Really, that was that was my um, that was my t- job when I was a teenager. Was I, I would have I had my own little thing going on, and I would coach and train kids. And um, I always knew I wanted to coach. I just wasn't sure of the level or to what degree I would take it in. Um, and I explored some options in the past couple of years of going into college coaching directly, um, trying to climb that those ranks right away. But when this opportunity presented itself, it just kind of fit in with my story. Um, and it, it, I couldn't say no. This, this, this was the job uh, for me because it, it's my alma mater. This is where I called home. Every time I came back to the States, I would, work out there, I train kids there, I did my thing there, and, and this, is, this is home to me. Uh, so when they asked me if I had interest in it, I, I, I certainly did, and the timing really worked out, and timing is the world's biggest mystery, because uh, if this presented itself a couple of years earlier, I, I would have had to say no, because I, I was still kind of doing my thing over there. Having two kids, my son being away for school, it was, it was time for us to, uh, to move back to the States and, and start my next life. And, uh, the timing of this really worked out. And, uh, I mean, I'm in a Catholic high school. It's a small Catholic co-ed, high, co-ed Catholic high school. I'm the associate athletic director and the head boys basketball coach. My, the plan is for me to become the athletic director next year, but my dream and my plan, um, and I will make it happen, is to be a head coach of a major Division One university or a head coach of an NBA team. Um, and I have a long way to do that because uh, I don't have to rely on my athleticism to do that, which has a which has a a, you know, a clock. Um, I don't have a clock on it. I don't have a time period, a time stamp on it. I'm playing a long game here. Uh, this is great experience for me as a coach because I'm running my own program. I am also running the sports program for 15 different teams. So for me, it's, it's a unique opportunity for me to work on my leadership skills, to, to get experience as a head coach, to learn how to run my own program, to uh, get my feet wet in in-game situations, uh, learn about recruiting. Uh, so many different moving parts of, of an athletic program, especially at the high school level, uh, dealing with administrative administrators and, and, and parents and uh, things of that nature so for me it's, it's the perfect thing for me to transition into if coaching is what I want to do and, and coaching is what I want to do no yeah I completely get it um I've coached high school baseball for the last four years here in Indianapolis at my alma mater as well um I'm not like a full-time coach I'm there as much as I can because I have a day job as well but I completely get it love uh I love baseball just as much as you love basketball um, have you had a chance? Um, well, for, for, go, go ahead. For me, they they, um, they 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 asked me about the basketball coaching position before the athletic director position, and my stipulation was I need a full time job in the school because that's the only way that I can really affect the culture of of not just the basketball program but the whole school. And, and I felt that I really needed a full time position now uh, to do that. If I was just a basketball coach, um, I would. First of all, I don't know what else I would do to, to, to earn money uh, from my family, so I had to figure that out. But I knew that the best way to affect the culture of the school was me to uh, get a full-time position there. And luckily enough, the timing of that also worked out. So uh, that's why I say timing is everything, and, and, and this was sort of lined up perfectly. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I saw a picture on Instagram a while back of, I think it was you, Ryan Ayers, and Mike Bray. Have you had a chance to maybe talk with them about um, your kind of plan as a coach and maybe trying to move up um, as well as what is your what would you say your coaching style is too? I know you talked about Mike Bray was a loose coach. Um, would you characterize yourself as that or are you more kind of uh, get on to the players? Uh-huh. Well, I, I, 
you know, as far as my, you know, I have spoken to Coach Bray and I speak to Ryan all the time on my, about my plan, my coaching plan. Or, you know, I, I, I do have to put it out there, and I will be honest with you, if, if ever there was a position at Notre Dame that opened up and they made it available to me, that's, that's a no-brainer. That's, that's an absolute dream job and, and one that I would be honored to, to be considered for. Um, that's, that's, that's something that I would, I would take in a heartbeat. Um, after speaking with my boss, my wife, but uh, that's 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 definitely a dream job for me. Uh, so I, I, I have spoken to them. Uh, Coach Bray's best advice for me this year is just this my first year. You know, not a lot of talent. You know, my program this year was just keep teaching. And I, I actually made a sign of it, just keep teaching, and I put it right in front of my desk where I don't just see it every day. I stare at it every single day, um, and it it kept me positive and focused on the right things, which is to try and uh, teach these kids the game and life lessons and, and, and how to play basketball. What is my coaching style? I'm, I'm, I'm intense, but I'm very positive. Um, very positive. And, and, you know, as Coach Bray will tell you, if you ask him, and I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but he considers himself a teacher. Um, and I try and focus on that more than anything. It's just teaching these guys the game and um, I can relate to these kids very well, and, and um, I have a really good rapport with them. But I don't play the bad cop as well as I play the good cop. So I just try and stay in my lane and, and be myself. Um, I, I have got intense at times, but it was necessary, and I made my point, and then we moved on. And, and I was joking the next time I said anything. So I, I try and keep a positive atmosphere. And again, that that, that was learned through uh, through Coach Bray. Um, environment he creates. No, I completely agree with you. There's a, as a baseball coach, there's one, th- there's something to be said for if you have a bad game, you go 0 for 5. There's, there's something to be said for that. But if you hit a pop fly and you don't run, run down to first base, then, then I get a little frustrated. I don't, I don't sure. never get mad for performance. Right. I always get mad. It's all about effort. Um, and then I told you to keep you under an hour here. Um, the last kind of question that I have written down, um, I, I kind of was doing some snooping on the uh, website of your high school. I see you have five principles, relationships, joy, education, integrity, and humility. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So when my head was spinning here about the kind of program that I want to run, and you know, I was investigating certain coaches and, and coaches who I follow and like, and they all have their thing, right? John Wooden has his period of, like, pyramid of success, and Tony Bennett has, at, at Virginia has his it's three three things over there that he focuses on. Um, at the high school level, it is a little bit different, but my pitch to them and, and my pitch to families who I speak to about the school is is number one. You know, I want to develop a relationship with with the student athletes, and I want to know what they want to do after after they graduate high school. Because uh, again, that's the only really real way that I can connect with them. If I know that you um, you want to play in, in college, then you know we're gonna we're gonna have a little bit of a different rapport here because I'm gonna be I'm gonna teach you some different things and I'm gonna work with you a little bit more in the off season. If, if you tell me you want to go to school to be a lawyer, then you know uh, come time when it, it comes time to look at some colleges, I'm gonna talk to some people. I'm gonna try and help you out there. If you tell me you want to be a fireman, it's a little bit different. So you know, uh, building relationships number one for me. Um, is really important. Um, of course, humility. Um, you know, you have to have humility, humility if you want to improve. Because uh, my high school coach used to say, the most important thing at the end of the day is if you can look at yourself in the mirror. And um, you know, I just, I just really, really believe that you know, everybody at any point is, is fighting their own fight, and, and you can't think. Um, and I, and I tell my guys, don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less, um, and, and, and be, be in service to others. Uh, number three is integrity. You know, we, as a Catholic high school in, in a time when Catholic education is taking a lot of, a lot of blows to the head, so to speak, we, we, we believe in doing things the right way. Um, and that's not just, just knowing what the right thing to do is that's actually doing it. Um, education, of course, that speaks for itself. We are a high school, we're not just a, a basketball or an athletic program. We are a school, so there, there's a big part, there's a big education component there. And me as the 
athletic director, I like to stay on top of my guys and throughout the year and, and check in on them in, in classes and, and whatnot. And again, that's a big benefit of me being part of the school. And then number five is joy. You know, I love this game. This is the best game in the world. And this can do so many wonderful things for you. And um, I know I take it very seriously, probably more serious than anybody in the world, but it's fun for me. And it should be fun for these kids um, that, that, that play here in my program and, and whatnot. So I, I fully believe that, that, that that's very important. And, 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 and again, that, that goes back to Coach Bray, right? Creating this positive environment and, and being positive with the kids and um, coming to the locker room and joking around or taking your shirt off, yeah. playing the drums, whatever it may be. Um, it's very important for these kids to feel that um, because, you know, you can't fake that. So having fun with the game and, and, and in the locker room and, and, and those things are really, really important to me. Yeah, and we've done several interviews here in the last several months and all um, former players who are, uh, whether it's Steve Astoria playing over in Europe or Justin Utupa, who's a head coach um, for a football program in California, or Cam McDaniel, who does motivational uh, work, uh, for his his job, it, it's all kind of it's all the same thing, um, the same realm as like you said, relationships, joy, education, integrity. It's all about being um, a Notre Dame man or woman and uh, valuing things on and off the court, um, and just being a great person in general. And um, what, so we hear about every time we have an interview, is this sort of thing, and um, to see what you're doing out there is just incredible. Thank you, I appreciate that. But you're absolutely right. It, it is. It is all the same thing, right? It's just how we spin it to make it our own. Um, but it, it is part of what being a Notre Dame man has, has really kind of brought out me is, is, you know, it's more than just being a basketball player. You're, you're a student athlete, and, and you're a student athlete who is at a Catholic school. So there, there's a bigger thing going on there. You know, it's not just you play basketball here. No, you represent more Catholic. And you represent me and you represent your family. So there's a standard of excellence here that we have to hold you to. And, you know, it, it's not just about winning. It's not about lo- winning and losing. That, that's, that's far from it. It's, it's more about, you know, the character that you, that you develop and, and, and how you represent yourself and your school. And boy, I mean, that's, that's, that's what Notre Dame is all about. And, and if I could bring that to a small Catholic high school here in Staten Island, then even if it's just a little bit, if I, you know, infest the culture with that there, uh, uh, just a little bit, then, then I'd be very proud. Uh, but I, I really appreciate the time, and I hope, really hope this gets out there to all the Irish fans. And um, uh, if anybody has any additional questions for me or or uh, wants to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. I'm, I'm, I'm on social media. Um, you can email me uh, as well. Absolutely. Nick, you got any more questions for you, Little? Uh, no, sir. I'm glad glad to hear that you're a little bit more Mike Bray style coach and Bob Knight style coach. I know that. Uh, I know even though I'm an IU fan, it's glad to hear that there's more coaches out there that give their players a little bit more freedom and more positive encouragement than uh, some people kind of old school style. Well, my 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 high school coach was Bob Knight esque, very very Bob Knight esque, and um, while he pushed me in ways no one ever has probably no one ever will um, and i appreciate that a lot um i just i just feel that especially nowadays you know kids respond a little differently to things um you know uh coach bray uh his coaching style resonated with me um i I, I believe kids are better off for that completely agree hey if you'll stay on the phone here with us we're just going to wrap up our show uh, it's Kyle McInerney. Sure. Um, so glad we um, asked him to come on our show. One of our favorite um, Notre Dame basketball players of all time. And we play with him on NSA basketball all the time. One of the best shooters in video game history. One of the best shooters in Notre Dame basketball history. 43, uh, or 43% three-point shooter at Notre Dame. 124 three-pointers a senior season. It was great to watch him. The Maui tournament, he went off. It was just uh, great to watch him at Notre Dame uh, when we were growing up. So thanks for watching again, guys. Hopefully we'll have another interview here in the next few weeks.